web streaming show uh, started during the pandemic as a way to get together and hang out, even though we're all in different places. And then we just decided to keep it going and keep hanging out with our amazing, cool, fun guests. So uh, today I have with me Flora Calderon. And uh, before we begin, I just want to remind you guys, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, like this, turn on notifications, and thank you to our sponsors, Metropolitan Water District and Southern California Edison for making this season of Poppy Hour possible. Oh, hey, Sophie. Oh, look at all you guys. Okay, great. I'm glad we have a nice big audience tonight. Uh, and my guest today, Flora Calderon, is a native Angelino and a local wildlife biologist focused on researching bats. She has been studying bats for the past eight years working for agencies such as USGS, National Park Service, and Wyoming Game and Fish. Following her passion for studying bats led her to live somewhat of a nomadic lifestyle, working seasonal positions in places like Hawaii, Washington, Wyoming, and Alaska. Wow, very jealous of that list. But her favorite place to catch bats is the desert Southwest. Since returning home to Los Angeles, she has sought out any opportunity to volunteer and spread the word about bat conservation. So thanks everybody for being here today to help that word get spread. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Floor. Great, okay. Let me just go ahead and share the screen. And you guys ask your questions, ask away. We're gonna hold them till the end. So you won't see your questions getting answered in the chat right away. But after the presentation, that is when they will be addressed. Right, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first off, thank you for, for having me here. But I'm really uh, happy people are interested in this. I didn't realize there was such a huge audience and now I'm a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, tonight I'm gonna be talking about how to create a bat-friendly garden. Um, and it's gonna focus on um, a few things, but what you can do here in Southern California. Um, and just want to point out, uh, one second, really quickly, um, this, uh, beautiful Margaret Gallagher print, uh, that I just picked up. Um, I chose this as the cover because it has a sacred datura plant it's hosting a little white light sphinx moth with a bat in the background coming to eat it. <laughs> um, very on point. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to just give a brief intro on bats themselves. Last week was uh, International Bat Week, and so I'm going to pretend like it still is. Um, so in the world, there are 1,400 species of bats, um, which makes up about a quarter of the mammals in the world. And so here in North America, we only have about 50 so species in, in the United States, we have 47. And most of those are insectivorous, um, eating moths, beetles, flies. And by most, I mean pretty much all of them, except for three that that are along the border of us and uh, Mexico. Uh, here in Southern California or in California, we have uh, 27 species. And this is this is a mug shot of most of them here. I'll go into um, more detail. Oh yes, 27 species um, of the bats uh, we have here in Los Angeles. So uh, uh, this is another Margaret Gallagher print um, of the bats uh, that can be found in the Los Angeles River. And I really love this poster because it looks like home to me. I live in these little hills in the background. Um, I just think it's a great poster. Um, and I actually have it behind me here, given to me by uh, Natural History Museum uh, personnel for doing some volunteer work. Um, but uh, the Natural History Museum has done a great effort to document uh, the 
the bat species here in Los Angeles County. And um, from word of mouth, I I think they have found about 16 species of bats here in LA. Um, don't quote me, that is what I remember hearing. But some of those species are, are, are here um, that I've placed. These are some of the common um, faces you'll see. This bat to the left, the upper left, is um, probably the most common urban bat you'll find. It's the Mexican free tail bat, called the Mexican free tail bat because it migrates to Mexico and it has a free tail, as you can see in this little picture. Um, they're great. They are notorious for their large maternity colonies. Um, in Texas, there's a cave called Bracken Cave that hosts up to what, from anywhere from 18 to 20 million bats, which is the largest congregation of any mammal in the world. Uh, pretty cool. Um, this uh, little bat to the right is actually called a big brown bat. Oops. Uh, they are not actually as common in Los Angeles, uh, but they're pretty common in California. They are super important because they are really good beetle eaters. Um, most of these bats, um, for for some, uh, they eat moths. Moths are in all bat diets, but it really depends on the region on what they're going to eat more of. And in some regions, the big brown bat can eat a lot more beetles than anything. Um, and that includes a lot of agricultural and garden pest species as well. Um, stuff like the cucumber beetle, the um, corn earworm moth, um, stuff like that. And so these, these bottom two species I put here um, because the one on the left is the canyon bat. And it is the smallest bat we have in the United States. Um, and if you're ever out at dusk hiking just outdoors and you see a bat, it's very uh, likely that it's going to be a canyon bat because they are the early risers of the bat community. They, they're gonna come out at sunset. And uh, to the right, we have the greater mastiff bat. And I also put him here because when he's the large, or they are the largest bats in North America uh, with a wingspan of about 24 inches. So it's about three times bigger than the canyon bat. Um, but if you're out, I don't know, camping or something at night and you hear some echolocation calls, 90% of the time it's going to be the greater mastiff bat. So um, uh, that is because uh, their echolocation calls are audible to humans around 10 kilohertz where all the other bats, you pretty much won't be able to hear. Um, so now you know that if you're out and about, uh, you you can impress your friends with that knowledge. You can be like, oh, that's a canyon bat. Oh, that's a bastard bat. Um, so that could be fun. Um, here we have uh, tree bats. So a lot of people might think that bats just live in caves. Um, you have a whole genus or a whole group of bats that are solitary uh, roosters that use trees as roosts. Um, and I lined them up here because they, I don't know, they just look really cute. And you can see the diversity. Like here in LA, we have yellow bats, we have red bats, silver haired bats, um, and the frosted tipped hoary bat, which is the second largest bat we have here in the United States. Um, pretty awesome to catch. A little scary. We wear the extra big leather gloves when we catch a hoary in the net. <laughs> uh, and so uh, why are bats important? Um, there's a lot of reasons why bats are important, but primarily um, the we we say the ecosystems uh, the ecosystem services that they provide for us are huge and um, pretty much invaluable even though they're constantly trying to put um, some kind of dollar value on them it's a very difficult thing to do um, but with things like insect press depression uh, just for agriculture alone in the United States the numbers range but it's definitely in the billions somewhere in the billions of dollars that they uh, save 
in agricultural costs annually. Um, another uh, service they provide is that their guano, aka bat poo, is very nitrogen rich fertilizer. Um, so anywhere you have a big like mass amounts of bats or bats roosting, you can harvest their guano or their guano is doing you know, really good things for the soil. Um, I'm not quite sure what makes guano guano, but bat poo you call guano, and then also shorebirds make a guano as well. And I think it has something to do with the nitrogen composition. Um, but anyway, uh, another reason why bats are super duper important, um, which doesn't necessarily um, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to bats in North America because we don't have any fruit eating bats uh, or um, not too many nectarivorous bats, uh, but they are excellent pollinators and uh, seed dispersal, um, seed dispersers. Um, they are also an excellent indicator species. Um, for example, the more, the more bats you have, uh, the more, the higher, bat diversity you have is a really good indication that that ecosystem is doing really well. Um, and so, as you know, many of you can assume, pretty much with all, if not mo most of the wildlife in the world is facing some kind of peril. Um, I pulled this information here off of Bat Conservation International, which is an amazing resource um, to learn about bats. Um, so you can see they keep track of what's going on. Um, I think this maybe these numbers total about a quarter of the bat species um, are not doing so well. So they need help. Hence this presentation on what can we do for bats or how can we be important for bats? Um, but uh, before I get into the gardening uh, aspect, I want to go over a few uh, facts and common misconceptions about bats. Um, for those of you who may not be bat, um, bat people, <laughs> um, the first thing um, I wanted to mention is that bats are not blind. I think that a lot of people might have that misconception because of the media, I think Batman, the movie has some, you know, they always say blind as a bat. I think that came from the way bats fly. Um, they tend to fly a little bit more erratic and that's because they're chasing bugs. <laughs> and oh. so they're not necessarily going from point A to point B They're, You know, it looks like they they don't know where they're going, um, but they have cones and rods in their eyes like we do. They see pretty similarly to humans, um, they didn't develop, oh, what's that called? Uh, a lucidum tapetum, maybe it's tapetum lucidum, um, that membrane in the back of the eye that a lot of nocturnal animals get uh, because they have echolocation. So most, uh, actually all of the North American bats use echolocation to find their prey. Um, echolocation of fruit bats is different. They don't need it so much to find their prey. They have a separate like a different style of echolocation. We'll get into that, but um, moving on <laughs> is uh, uh, vampire bats. That's, I think, one of the things I probably, that gets mentioned to me the most when I start talking to um, somebody about bats. They're curious about the vampire bats. And yes, vampire bats are real, but there are only three species of vampire bats. Out of 1,400 species, there's only three. Uh, so they're not very common. And they only exist in um, the southern parts of Mexico, Central America, and about half of South America. Um, so we're good here. You don't have to worry about that. Um, babies. So wait, wait, wait. That wait. Is... Ask... Sure. Do, do vampire bats drink blood, though? Is that yes. what they're called that? 100% that is what they feed on. Wow. <laughs> um, they, so bef they, they would feed on, you know, large, um, mammals and birds that are probably perched and asleep. Um, now they feed on a lot of agricultural animals. Um, but yeah, they, they have such interesting features that allow them to feed on, um, blood. Their, you know, their saliva has been heavily studied for its anticoagulant properties. Um, 
what else? They have been documented to it, f- finding, um, what's the word? Uh, shoot, I can't remember the word. Where uh, you, where, where a species might do something for, for another member of the species just because of um just to help one out i'm, I'm blanking on the word right now oh, if you put it in the chat. Social. <sighs> anyway that's been documented in, in vampire but <laughs> <laughs> they're altruistic <laughs> i don't know yeah i it's a yeah it's Some a bias, yeah. somewhere <laughs> um no not that one um shoot. mutually beneficial it is mutually beneficial but that's not so not a parasite no, not a parasite. Where they, so they'll vomit blood after a blood meal into oh, the mouths of a bat mutual, that didn't get to eat that oh, night. Is it, okay. So um, helping out their friends. So it's helping out the bat. And it's really hard to document yeah. uh, that in oh. in wildlife because you don't really know, you know, you don't know their thought process. Mm-hmm. But that's something cool about vampire bats. Um, oh, right. Rabies. <laughs> So uh, rabies is also a real thing. Um, it can be potentially fatal if you're bitten um, by a bat and you don't get it taken care of and you wait a few days and symptoms start showing, it will be fatal when symptoms show. If you're ever bitten by a bat, you would want to just get your rabies vaccinations immediately, um, which is why you never want to touch a bat with bare hands. Um, a lot of the times you'll see pictures with bare people with bare hands holding a bat and that's a big no-no like we have if you're a bat biologist you know over five years you probably have pictures of you holding a bat with bare hands that's not really something we do anymore unless it's you know a rehabbed bat that's you know doesn't have rabies um or or something but uh, for the most part, we wear leather gloves to protect our fingers, and then we wear nitrile gloves, as you see here, to protect the bat because we don't want to spread diseases. There's um, a disease called white nose syndrome that's been affecting a lot of bats, um, moving over mostly hibernating bats. Um, I won't get into too much detail about that, but generally, when when bats get rabies, they they're more like they're they're likely to get sick and fall to the ground and that's where people come in and they think that this bat might need help um and that's where a bat would bite a hand is when you know it's getting picked up it thinks it's you know it's threatened it doesn't know what's going on yeah it's responding to that threat right so a, a bat mm, very unlikely to attack a human i've never heard of it i've heard I've seen, I've read stories in the, in the news that have alluded to that. Totally just bogus accusations. So like bats don't just go around biting people. They don't go fun. around biting. They do not go around biting. If they're stuck in a home, they might fly around and it might look like you're being attacked, but they're just, that's just how they fly. Like they'll, you know, it'll look like they're going down. Um, I have like, for example, doing um emergence counts been standing in a corridor where bats fly all the time and it looks like it feels like they're playing um like chicken with you like flying straight at you but they're really curious and they'll go they know exactly what they're doing they're very agile Mm. um and so it it seems like you're being attacked but you're not they're just scoping you out you know they're just curious yeah (laughs) So and we're afraid of them because we don't understand them. Right. But they're curious. <laughs> I think that's about most us, of it. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to. A, a bat, a healthy bat is not going to bite you for, for no reason. Um, even if it's stuck in your, in your house, it's very, very, very unlikely. Um, let's see. Um, so here's a few things. What are that, those some figs in a fig tree? Yes. <laughs> so this is a eucalyptus <laughs> plums in a in a tree. Um, th- these are Hawaiian hoary bats um, that I took a picture of. We were monitoring this, uh, what you would call like a maternity roost, um, but they uh, they move around from from tree to tree so quickly. Uh, tree bats don't have a lot of sight fidelity, uh, but this is. 
uh, goes along with one of the facts they have that bats have about one to two pups per year. Um, most have one and that's, you know, that's on a good year. That's like, they're doing great. They're, they can have one pup a year. Some species have twins and that's what happened here. These, uh, this Hawaiian hori had twins, um, and they are just roosting during the day, bundled up together. Um, I think they're about a couple months old at this in this picture, um, pretty, almost, pretty much almost the size of the mother. <laughs> um, so bats are long-lived, relatively long-lived, um, really depends on the species um, in the wild, anywhere from five, 10 years and up to over 30 years has been documented. Um, another thing is, yes, they are small mammals, but they are not very closely related to rodents on the evolutionary like tree. Um, if anything, I think humans might be more closely related to rodents than bats are. Um, so not, they're small mammals, they look alike, but they're not related. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to say that they have a lot of different um, life strategies. Some um, some hibernate, use caves, mines, rock crevices, buildings. Um, some migrate. Some some hibernate in leaf litter. Even um, some can hibernate for weeks. Some can hibernate for months. Um, it really just depends. Um, some bats migrate. They don't hibernate at all. And then uh, some bats just hang out. They just chill. They don't go anywhere even though their brothers might go migrate or their other species might go hibernate and they they might just decide to hang out. And it really, I think it depends on um, the, the climate, the, you know, the, the habitat they have. I think in, for example, Western Oregon, they're doing more studies. They found out some of them just stay there all year and don't go anywhere. Um, so there's a lot to learn about bats and their behavior, um, which makes them really fun to study. We okay. have a question, maybe just since you were just talking about that, do the bats in LA hibernate? Um, I think there are some species that can hibernate. Um, most of them, or I can't say most because I don't know, like the I'm counting Depends. some migrate yes yeah, so, some hang out and then some some can hibernate okay. yes right. yes um let's see so getting into creating bat friendly gardens um if you've done a bat friendly anything like wildlife friendly butterfly friendly gardening for you know any Anything that's alive, it, there's going to be a lot of overlap. You basically want to provide the basics that anything needs um, to live, which is food, shelter, and water. And so the food, um, the food for bats is insects. And so uh, basically, if you want to promote um, bats in your yard, you want to um, have plants that host native insects that bats eat. So a bat-friendly garden is essentially a moth-friendly garden, um, bug-friendly garden. Um, shelter is equally important. You might not want bats um, living in your in your near, super near your house, but you can provide um, landscape structure for them to forage. Um, if you do, there are um, several different types of roosts that can accommodate several different species. Uh, like here we have like the palm, the California palm, fan palm, um, that hosts, uh, I think about 12 species in Los Angeles. So they can be pretty important. Um, and then water. So the first thing, um, that bats do when they emerge from their roosts is they go get a drink of water and um, bats fly, bats drink water on the wing. So long pools of fresh water are um, ideal for bats. Um, I don't know if you could see in this picture, there's a little bat drinking water from that, that pool. Um, but having said that, 
if you're a bat in the desert, if there's a tiny puddle, you're gonna, they're gonna go for it. So pretty much depends on what's what's available. Okay. So um, I mentioned landscape structure is important for bats. Um, there are open, uh, there are bats that are adapted to more open landscapes and bats that are adapted to foraging more cluttered landscapes, but uh, still all bats need some kind of space to fly through. And um, we like to call it like linear landscape elements. Um, Stuff like open flight corridors, um, like alleys or trails or creeks, rivers are great. Um, riparian corridors are, are great for bat movement. Um, so I picked this uh, photo provided um, to me. Uh, it's from the Natural History Museum garden. And I really like it because um, you could see, you know, there's a little flight corridor here going down the trail. You have this linear tree um, landscape element, uh, which can one serve as a roost, but it can also serve as protection from wind or predators as the bat is flying. Uh, bats like to fly around edged habitat um, for those reasons. And there's also food sources here. There's a yucca um, and other native plants, which is just great habitat here. Um, and then um, this picture here is, uh, shows, a, you know, a, a typical, what I think is a typical city alley. Um, I think there's a lot of missed opportunities in urban city landscaping that can be, it can be a lot more wildlife friendly. Um, and it, it could do it pretty easily. You, know, you could just let things grow where they would and you would have you know a, a much more bat friendly probably bird friendly and most wildlife friendly uh corridor here you know if you feel loud uh nature to do its thing um so shelter um i, I mentioned there are a lot of tree bats in uh, Southern California that use trees for for roosts, um, but that's not necessarily all of them. Um, there are some species that can hibernate in uh, crevices or not just hibernate, but roost in like tree bark, for example, or use um, tree snags to, to roost in. Um, but I understand that, you know, living in a city, you might not want um, dead trees around. It might be a fire hazard or you might be required to remove it. Um, the fire department might got, get on you for that. Um, but big trees like sycamores and oaks are great for a lot of wildlife. Um, bats, for instance, um, might not use this cluttered lower portion of a tree, but they they tend to roost in the higher portions that are more open. So when they emerge, they can go out into the open. Um, so taller trees are great. Um, dense trees are great for that. And then over here, um, I mentioned artificial roosts, one of the most popular being uh, bat houses, um, bat boxes. And um, they there are there's a lot of literature on the right way and wrong way to put up a bat box and that's also like a whole nother um a whole nother talk <laughs> for just bat boxes but um if you are interested in putting up a bat box or you have a bat box um there's a few things that you should pay attention to um one don't put them in trees you'll see a lot of pictures of them in trees, but that opens them up to predation risks from anything that can crawl up a tree, basically. Um, don't paint them black or any other color. The paint can have toxins. And here in Southern California, it can get really hot. Um, so it might be a little too hot sometimes, which is also why they recommend uh, houses with multiple chambers. Um, so this, we can see there's different slots this is what we you would see looking up one of these slots. Um, 
And funny story, the first time I ever looked in a bat box, I got peed. My eyes got peed in. No. <laughs> yeah. So um, what but did you I'd do? Like, take like a periscope to look in there? Like, ah, <laughs> bypass the glasses into the eyes. It's okay, though. <laughs> Um, there's like a saying of, in the bat world that you, you've been baptized if you get wow. <laughs> Um, but this I'd like to add, um, this is a new thing too. They used to put mesh, wire mesh in the back boxes. So they have somewhere to hold on to, but now they're recommending not to put wire mesh because it could break and they could, their wings could get snagged on them. So there's, there's a lot of right and wrong ways to do bat boxes. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the fronds on palm trees are super important for some bat species. Um, in particular, the Western yellow bat, which is here in Southern California, um, a really cute bat. Um, they're not palm tree obligates, but they're highly associated with, with roosting in the fronds. Here we have, um, one that made a little, that made use of, I think this was an Oriole nest. Um, and I'm not sure what happened if it, if the nest itself fell out or how, but um, this photo was provided by Cindy Myers, who is an amazing bat rehab person um, in S San Diego County. Um, so yeah, very uh, important that you don't trim palm fronds if, for whatever reason you really want to trim the palm fronds or trim any any of your large like trees um there's the pup season um which is pretty much from june to august where the pups can't fly they haven't become buoyant yet and so they start flying in around august so um you know if, if you would focus trimming trees or fronds outside of the pup season that would be great um and you know leaving the leaf litter on the ground I'm sure you know you've heard has a lot of benefits for a lot of different kinds of critters um but there is one bat in particular the red bat that is known to hibernate in the leaf litter on the ground just like one of the red leaves it's a red bat looks like a red leaf you would you wouldn't even know it's there so um water sources um you know unless you're a super desert adapted kangaroo rat you're gonna need water um and so bats drink on the wing or aka in flight you can, you know, get fancy and put a pond in with waterfalls and a bunch of features, or you can dig a, you know, a hole in the ground. <laughs> you can dig a, a little, um, I think this is a rain pond. Um, and it's really cool because they put little channels to, to channel the rain um, into this little dirt hole they have here, which I think looks like it works really well um if you have the space and the resources this is an ideal setup this is also from a bat rehabber cindy myers um she has uh an excellent setup and an excellent home um with a lot of bad activity uh so this long linear uh pond is ideal if you can um, what she's done is put this plastic hardware cloth along, um, the interior of the pond to help, um, a lot of things get more stable footing. Like if you're a little bird or, um, insects, whatever, um, it's easy to climb up and off that it's not slippery. Um, I think she mentioned after installing that, that they have a lot more, um, a lot less dead insects in their pond. And also, um, if you're worried about mosquitoes, um, stuff like that. So I know bats can't eat everything, um, but you could get um, mosquito fish, which I just learned are available for free by who? 
the, f- the fish. Department of Vector Control if you're in Vector Los control. Angeles. They'll come to your house. It was within 24 hours last time I called them out. That's awesome. Yeah. So they'll eat your your mosquito larva for you if you have stagnant water. Um, and another thing I want to mention are these frog logs, which if you have a pool or a pond are, you know, is something that if if something falls in, we'll greatly appreciate it, like a bat or a rodent, or if you have a really large pool, yeah, pretty much anything I've seen horrible things online, um, you know, things getting stuck in in pools. So these things are nifty. Um, bats can swim. But, you know, eventually they'll tire out um, and drown. So if you have something like this, it would be great. Um, And so getting into the plants. um, What you would want is to provide um, food sources for these batch, which are insects, which really means that you want plants that are night that are friendly towards night flying insects. Um, This poster here um, is, I think those are UK species. If you try to look up a lot of bat garden um, information, the UK is way up on the US. They have a lot more resources, I find. Um, So some of these, some of these plants aren't native, but I will get into the native ones in just a second, but it has good information. Um, the, uh, the general gist of it is that you want night blooming flowers, um, flowers that are white or light colored, um, tend to be better for, and more adapted towards, um, nocturnal pollinators. Um, and so you want native plants to attract native insects. And some of the particulars are, Um, Plants with single flowers, which tend to produce more nectar. Um, The light colored flowers. Um, And then um, we have here flowers with insect friendly landing platforms, um, which which could be helpful. Um, So this, most of the plants I've mentioned here are really geared towards moths because we know that moths are in all diets of the insectivorous bats here in North America. Um, But you can definitely, you know, if you have certain night flying beetles, um, fly, they eat flies, they eat mosquitoes, they eat all of those juicy insects. So getting to the particulars, um, I, this is an exhaustive list. I maybe gathered about 10 um, of the more common plants to host moth species that can be very beneficial um, for bats. Um, we have evening primroses that uh, bloom at night. Very, um, very, very moth friendly. Uh, this, is, this is a beetle, but still bat food. Um, this is uh, the sacred detura, and I think it, I don't know if I've ever seen them in a garden. I've only really seen them in the wild, or especially in the Mojave, um, but I took this picture, how was it, somewhere in Corona, um, but I think I thought that it just made a really pretty addition if you had trees or something in your garden or some taller structure. I think having them at the base of that structure would just be a nice little um, border, little element to add. Um, And that's another thing. Um, If you're very limited on space in your garden, having something like vertical structure and making the most of your space um, would be ideal. Say, you know, short plants, medium shrubs and taller trees all in just one little area, um, you get most of your space um, utilized. Another one that's really great for moths is the yucca, the chaparral yucca. Um, Beautiful plant, I love having them. 
I love seeing them around. Um, yeah, you, they're just, I, I just think they're very beautiful to, to see. And once you get them established, uh, yeah, it's a little hard. Um, and it takes some patience as well, but, um, I think they just make really pretty plants. And next we have uh, buckwheats. I think all of the native buckwheats, um, when I was researching, um, host a good amount of moths. Um, this is, I took this center picture at the Theodore Payne Nursery. And more often than not, you see, especially, you know, um, down here in SoCal, you're hiking. This is a very, very common plant you see. Um, and more often than not, they're not in bloom. They're they're brown like this, but I think they look really cool like that too. Um, this we agree, one, agree. yeah. <laughs> um, this one on the left is a California buckwheat, and the one on the right is the ashy leaf buckwheat. Both are great um, for moth species, especially the small moths um, that are more common bat food. Um, if you find a lot of resources for that are like gardening for butterflies or gardening for moths. They often um, focus on the more charismatic species and the more charismatic species of moths are like the big Luna moths or the white line sphinx moths, which are great, but they're not the best bat food. Um, some might be a little too big for bats. Um, the bats aren't that big, but they can eat them. But if you're you know, trying to garden for those moths, maybe you don't want the bats to eat them. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it. But, um, but these little flowers host very small moths, which are excellent bat food. Um, and you really can't go on, wrong with any Ariagnum that's native. They're, you know, very adapted to the climate here. Um, so this plant, is excellent. Um, the red fairy duster. This is in the parking lot of the the Theodore Payne Nursery, yeah, and I yeah. took a video, but I decided not to show it. Um, and the reason I took a video is because there, th it was covered with pollinators, just every nonstop. Every you can't see it in this picture, but there were bees and flies, and I don't know. I think in maybe one minute I saw like 15 different species it's all um, covered in pollinators yeah so <laughs> this is great um also good for moths um and this is a big this is a you know this is a big grown shrub um but they can be a, a more manageable size as well they have really beautiful flowers and so like I said there's a lot of overlap between a bat friendly garden and a, a butterfly garden if you have you know, a, a butterfly garden, you probably have a very bat friendly garden as well. Um, just add a few little nuanced um, night bloomers and you can have a, a great bat friendly garden. Uh, the Southern honeysuckle, um, another native plant. Um, they don't grow too big. Um, I don't remember if it was viney or not, but a pretty, pretty plant. Um, I think I read they produce a good amount of nectar. So you want to know if they, um, your plants are producing nectar or offer pollen. Um, some moths as adults might not eat, but their larva might require um, pollen versus nectar or nectar versus pollen. Um, so you might want to pay attention to that if you're if you want to get really into the nitpickiness of what plants are in your garden. Um, the California fuchsia, also another really excellent plant, um, a beautiful plant to have in your garden as well. Um, big red flowers. I know generally I said um, night uh, white or light colored flowers are best, but that doesn't, they're not, they don't have to be only uh, white or light colored flowers. Um, another one is the California goldenrod. When in bloom, and I've, I've never seen this in bloom, I've only seen it <laughs> dried out. <laughs> um, 
but it looks like it's beautiful. And I heard that it can bloom in the fall. So that's another thing is that you ideally would want to have things blooming at different times of the year. So, you, you know, you could stretch out that the time um, that there's food sources available as, you know, something's dying out. You have that um, phenology of insects coming in and there'll be something available to eat at all times. Um, this is the California four o'clock. Uh, I think it it can grow kind of widespread and matted to have um, to take up a lot of space that you might have in a garden um, that you might want to fill pretty little flowers. Um, yeah, all these flowers I chose are I chose because they host moth species and I thought might look good in a garden. <laughs> Uh, this one, however, um, might be a little bit difficult to garden. Um, this is the Mojave Aster. If you're more in the in the eastern regions of SoCal, um, you might have seen this. Um, but here are two little moths taking a nap in a Mojave Aster. Oh. Um, so just to show, um, they can be really pretty it hosts a lot of different pollinators and they have this it almost looks like it emits uv rays it probably does but it, this like Holy light purple God. yeah it's really pretty um if you can if you live in a little bit more drier um san Bernardino county um it'd be a great flower and so, um, I don't know what time we're at. What time is it? We might go a little bit over. We're at 6.8. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Just real quick, some plant list resources. Um, I got, the, I picked this book up actually at the nursery, the Therapy um, Nursery. It has a little section on gardening for moths. And in that section, um, breaks up, um, the regions. So for example, um, you know, a uh, pestamen or goldenrod, like I mentioned here, it has a little asterisk for nectar value. It gives you a little bit of information, but also um, available is this native plants for butterflies and moss. And in this list gives you it's food for or nectar for, um, and it has some kind of moth species. Like here we have the um the four o'clock uh what else it lists a good amount of of moss yeah and yeah. um I think maybe most of these plants are available there to to purchase yeah, yeah. and so additional bat resources um bat conservation international has some guides to gardening for um, guide to gardening for bath. I know that they don't have um, a native plant list yet, but they they're working on getting a bigger um, a big list per region. Um, and the Natural History Museum also um, are the ones that provided all those bat mug shots that you saw earlier. Um, they they have a huge, amazing um, effort to monitor bats. Um, throughout Los Angeles, they have a lot of good resources online. So you should check that out. And they also have a lot of uh, volunteer opportunities, which is how I got associated with them. I started doing the uh, the roost counts that they do in the summer. Um, you, They need people to um, count bats as they emerge out of their roosts, which is a, a very tricky, hard effort. Um, and so uh, look out for that next year. Um, and with that, thank you. Take any questions. Amazing. Thanks so much. I'm just putting a bunch of links in the chat. Uh, we had a ton of questions, so okay. let's get to it. Um, do bats make nests ever? You had that one picture of one in someone else's nest. <laughs> okay. Not in North America. I have heard of some 
like uh, tropical species doing doing things, um, manipulating leaves to to make shelters, or um, uh, yeah, but not not in North America. They don't make nests at it all. It sounds like there's a lot of variation between all the different bats. They there's have a lot of different behaviors. There's, and thousands, there's like a thousand style. something four hundred yeah. bats. There's probably one that does something. That, you know, okay. but um, but not that I know of. I don't know of any bat nests. Okay, and we also got a lot of questions about the bat boxes and ponds for bats. So, okay, can you make your own? bat box oh definitely I've okay. def I've made some bat boxes uh it's a really fun project uh you know you're you are gonna need at least um a mini drill <laughs> mm -hmm. um they have they they have online um like blueprints that okay. you can make yourself from um, bat con right bat bat conservation they probably have, oh, yeah, they probably have blueprints up. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a lot so of fun to me. For the pre-made ones, is there one that you recommend that you like, like one company? Um, I haven't researched the, cause I've, I've always made them myself too. Um, mm, I haven't researched the companies, but I know that there's bad companies to look out for. Um, and you know, like I said, look up, I'm, I think, Backcon probably Bat Conservation International probably has some literature on okay. what to look for in a bat box. Uh, so I would check their website out for that. Um, and where should bat boxes go? Like on a building or just on a pole? Should they be far away from people? In Los Angeles and pretty much everywhere in North America, for the most part, they want that morning sun. So anywhere you morning could put sun. that is facing um southeast and then you they do pretty well on the sides of houses um mm -hmm. that i a lot of people put them on poles as well if you want it away from your house um or just, just you know on a, if your house maybe over, not tall enough yeah sometimes like you know your home structures. <laughs> yeah exactly you, you're gonna have a pile of guano underneath <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you're successful <laughs> But a lot of homes aren't high enough. If you're like single story homes, um, you want them a little high. They they drop down and then fly off. So they need some space um, to do that. And yeah, a lot of it is trial and error too. Um, sometimes they just don't. Sometimes there's no there's not a lot of bats. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to exclude bats from your attic, a bat house is a great way to exclude them. You know, you wait till they emerge close it off and then you could put the bat box where they close to where normally they would come in or something okay um, so there's then, sorry. there's a lot of literature on it cool so do some research before you settle on one um what about for the pond does it need to be like filtered water or is tap water okay because of the fluoride in it oh um I don't it's know if anybody's question. <laughs> really looked at that. As long yeah. as it's fresh water, they'll drink okay. it. <laughs> Great. Good, and you know, how close should the water source be to the nesting box if you're doing both? The closer, the better. Um, mm -hmm. That some bats can travel long distances, some bats maybe one kilometer home range, um, but they you you always get more bats where there's more water i think that might be true for a lot of just life in general um okay. but the closer the better um i don't know if we're talking like a hundred meters or like half a kilometer but you mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. you and want sometimes just a crevice will do right sophie is saying she sees them between roofing tiles or in closed oh, yeah. state umbrellas so you <laughs> yeah. don't need to go fancy. Even in the umbrellas. That's why I put crevices. You never know. They're, they're crevices. Any little crack. They <laughs> never underestimated yeah. the value of a good crevice. Yeah. Okay. And then a we good... also had a lot of questions about bat predators. You mentioned don't put the nesting box in the tree because predators can climb up the tree. Mm -hmm. What types of animals prey on bats? 
So uh, owls can prey on bats, hawks can prey on bats, mm. uh, snakes, um, squirrels, birds. Birds are a little crazy. That's why bats are nocturnal. They they mm. can't uh, they can't compete during the day. Um, so birds will ha- you know can have a a, a severe impact on uh, bats um, if they're nearby. Um, but pretty much anything that could eat a bat um, will eat it. Skunks, if they fall, um, possums. Yeah. Okay. And then we had a question about will bats go after butterflies that are on your milkweed? Aren't butterflies kind of just daytime creatures? They are. They don't have much overlap. Um, okay. Yeah. So they're diurnal and bats. I yeah I don't I don't they are nocturnal I heard that they don't taste that good either <laughs> mm. the monarch okay. yeah they, I, they don't really taste good um <laughs> I think I, I remember the textbook having a, a seed picture of a bird before it ate a monarch and then after it ate a monarch it had like vomited and its feathers are all like ruffled uh oh, so they wow. have that like that defense mechanism where they f- feed on the milkweed and it makes them taste horrible apparently <laughs> Okay, so we're we're getting some plant recommendations. People are saying there's other asters you can do that host other oh, yeah. moths. You can always, oh yeah, if you look on Cowscape, it'll say what butterflies and moths are hosted by the different. So many, so at. many options. Yeah, I think did everyone learn something new here? Are there any last lingering questions that I missed? I think we kind of covered stuff. Are there like bat? seasons we should be aware of in southern california you said that definitely summer um, is the babies yes spring to fall basically but the pu- the baby season um they start having their pups around in late may um and they're unable to fly for about i don't know six to eight weeks um don't quite remember probably depends on the species but um uh, in August is when they really start learning to fly. And in that season, when they're learning to fly, you can get a lot of um, bats on the ground, bats being clumsy, bats crashing into things. And that's when the bat rehabbers, that's like their peak season is when the pups are out learning to be bats. Um, uh, so definitely August is the time to be most aware of a bat in trouble if you ever do come across a bat, um, you know, you can scoop it into a box, make sure you don't touch it and look, you, I contact, um, what is it? The wild, wildlife uh, control. Um, and then there's some, there's bat rehabber information online mm-hmm. as well. Um, I'm not sure if Bat Conservation International has a link to local, like, I know they have like, what do you do if you find a bat? And then it might lead to mm-hmm. like um, regional phone numbers or something. Okay. But yeah, definitely. What about someone wants, Sarah wants to know if bats will drink from a swimming pool. Bats will drink from swimming pools. Um, the first time I went to Arizona and I was in a swimming pool in a hotel, there were bats flying all over me. Oh! Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's the greatest thing. But if there's freshwater options around, uh, they will definitely go for that first. Um, it's really a trade-off of how much they have to fly versus, you know, what quality water is around. It's not good to drink chlorinated mm-hmm. water. For sure. Not good for them. Yeah. But if it's the I, only option. They'll do it. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering, can you make a statement right now in front of everyone on bug zappers? Bug zappers. Are they bad should we take them down because they're killing all the moths i don't have enough information okay that's (laughs) i don't know anybody who uses we're not gonna soak any controversy right now (laughs) um, i i mean i guess i would say they're not great because they're just killing killing bugs unnecessarily that are food Um, they could be potential food um you could have bug lights that don't zap that could be a thing to draw them in 
Yeah, that's how you survey right, for right. moths and night flying. Um, you can put yeah, have them in a yeah. container. Just I've attract them hang, away. People hang like a white sheet next to a light. Oh yeah, for the moth to land on. Trapping. Uh huh. So cool. <laughs> well, we could go on talking all night about this, but this was a great presentation. And uh, be sure to follow Floor on Instagram at Bat Bio Bruja. I posted a link, but I'm going to post it again. So if you have any more questions, that is where he can be found. And let's go out and tell all our friends how great bats are and they're not scary. We promoted this as part of like spooky season, like Halloween, just because it's a vibe. Oh yeah, it's but nocturnal we do not November. think bats are scary. <laughs> we do not think bats are scary. We love them. So, you know, I hope we weren't adding to that misinformation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And this will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, if anyone wants to go back and watch and soak in all the information and just keep planting good plants for butterflies and moths. I think that's the main takeaway. So thanks, Floor. Thanks uh, you. to our sponsors, Metropolitan Water District and Southern California Edison. And thanks to all of our Theodore Payne members, donors, customers, and everybody here tonight thank you for your time and go enjoy the rest of your evening and have good dreams about all the bats out there flying around while we sleep bye everybody thank you.